I do gain in Allah's name the beneficent, the merciful, all praise belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for giving us this life, the opportunity to represent Him on this earth because Allah considers us worthy to represent Him on this earth. And representation means it's universal that all of us intelligent beings have to uh, represent Allah and the representation implies that there are certain obligations upon us which then fulfills the objective of representation. And the objective is, Allah in the Quran says, كُنْتُمْ خَيْرَ أُمَّةٍ أُخْرِجَتْ لِلنَّاسِ تَأْمُرُونَ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَتَنْهَوْنَ عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ وَتُؤْمِنُونَ بِاللَّهِ This is the fundamental principle of obligations that we have as representatives of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What is the obligation? Allah says, you are the best in the ummah. كُنْتُمْ خَيْرَ أُمَّةٍ أُخْرِجَتْ لِلنَّاسِ You're the best in the community. What makes you the best? تَأْمُرُونَ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ You promote good. وَتَنْحَوْنَ عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ You forbid evil. وَتُؤْمِنُونَ بِاللَّهِ And you believe in Allah. These three fundamental principles are something that we have to discuss very carefully because ultimately everything boils down to this kind of this realization that my life everything should be built on this on this extremely important premise that belief in Allah is fundamental the promotion of good and the demotion of evil everything else that happens as a consequence is really secondary is not primary now we may ask why is it that and first of all you will see that uh, the promotion of good and forbidden of evil is a universal principle. There's no sane human being on earth who would reject that principle. You can talk to an atheist about it, talk to a Christian, a Jew, a skeptic, even a skeptic, one who's not certain about life, will tell you promotion of good is superior and demotion of evil is also superior. There's no problem with that. Where the problem lies is in the definition of good and evil. That's the biggest problem. It's highly subjective. And that subjectivity leads to all kinds of misunderstandings in life, which causes us to cause damage uh, with, the th with the intent that, well, I'm doing something good. Uh, and we end up being criminals, for example, with this intent deep down in us that, well, you know, uh, it's okay, I'm good. Now, of course, there's a limit. You find even criminals who commit heinous crimes try to mitigate the intensity of their evilness by making themselves somehow victims. They may say, look, I had to steal, I had to cheat, I had to kill, I had no options. We try to mitigate it, we try to lessen the intensity of the evil uh, actions because deep down our conscience is biting us. Because our conscience, our fitra as we call it, really knows that the promotion of good is superior. And the minute we indulge in the promotion of evil, it we call it uh, imbalances, it causes an imbalance in our ethos, which causes us to feel very uncomfortable. It, what we call it, it bite, it's biting me, it's disturbing me, because I committed a very bad deed. And the way you mitigate that, the way you lessen it, is by marginalizing the intensity of the negative by saying, well, I'm a victim, or I had to do it, or it's not so bad. You know, it, it's, you, you, you think it's bad, but it's really not that bad. And what ends up happening is that the definitions of good and evil are highly subjective. Okay? You'll find the, um, for example, the humanist, he's going to say, well, I have a conscience, and my conscience tells me what's good and what's bad, and that's enough. And I can go out and research using science and figure out my parameters as to what is good and what is evil. And those all appear to be rosy, but actually they're deadly. They're very, very dangerous because morality, which is the net result of the definition of what is wrong and what is right, is, cannot be subjected to whimsical borderlines. You cannot do that. If you do that, what ends up happening is that we have all kinds of problems that ultimately feeds into the human race, which then builds kind of an attitude in the human society that cannot be changed for long periods of time. So communities that violate basic moral principles ultimately breed a generation or generations of those kind, which then is very hard when they realize later on that this was a big mistake we made socially, 
by building an ideology that is really destructive, but it's too late. Generations are gone, gone, and one life is too much to lose, as we would say. It's too much to lose. All it takes is one life to lose, and that's enough to, to create a lot of problems. So what is it in our lives that we have to discuss as a, as a community? When we talk about the subject today, which is Muslim identity, how do I identify myself? What is, why do I need an identity? And why is this identity so important to have credibility? Why can't I just identify myself as Joe Blow? You know, what difference does it make? Why do I have to be a Muslim submitter? You know, why do I have to have a certain core principle? Why do I have to adhere to the Quran? Why do I need to go back 14 centuries to find out, you know, what my life is all about from the Sunnah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So, what is what is it that I need to do? From the fundamental principles, you will see that since we all agree, and I want you to slice this in a very sim simplistic way, but you will see the gravity of the conversation that. You know, when we talk about health issues, for example, when physicians or scientists talk about health issues, you know, eating this food will cause you this, or avoiding this will cause this, or if you have a certain diet, this will happen, or how do you avoid cancer, how do you avoid these things? If you really examine those, it's, it's, it's of importance to all of us, right? When we talk about diet issues, health issues, um, if, if science comes What up, is it that's, why is it universal? If a, if a doctor speaks about health issues, if a scientist says something about uh, global warming, for example, or we talk about anything that's affecting us all, it's everybody's conversation. Why is it? Because it's universally affecting us. It's important to us. It affects us. It's the choice we make, right? If there's a new diet pill that has just come out, and if you take it, you'll magically lose 10 pounds. Well, everybody's going to talk about it. Why? Well, because diet is a big problem in society, especially in America. We've got the fattest people on earth in America. Um, you know, in fact, obesity now has surpassed malnutrition in the world. That's to show you the imbalance of the world that we live in today. There are more obese people today than there are malnutrition people in the world. Think about it. That's absurd. So it's a big issue. Now, why is it important? Why am I bringing such analogies? Because that which affects us all has great implications, not only from a scientific point of view, from a social point of view, political point of view, okay, ideological point of view, it, it's, it's universal, what we call it is ubiquitous, it's everywhere. So when we talk about morality, okay, it is the ultimate most important subject. If you look at the world today, you will see that all the wars that are taking place right now, people say it's about oil and money, it's not. Trust me, it's not. Don't be fooled by it. It's really a facade. It's a front end. Sure, the greed factor is there, the oil factor is there, the conglomerate corporations are there. But really, really, when you go deep down, it's not about that. It's an ideological warfare. It's the war of ideologies. Ask any pundit who knows global politics will tell you everything that's happening in the world today, it's an ideological war. We're fighting a war of ideologies. Trust me. I say it simply because if money and power and oil was the only thing, why are Muslims being vilified? Why are we why are we being marginalized? Why is Islam the number one agenda in the world today? Why is the hijab such a sticking point for people? I mean, imagine if you were to wear a hijab and say, you know, by me wearing a hijab, you'll become a millionaire. Who would stop you from wearing hijab? But it's not the case. It's not about money. It's about ideologies. Because deep down, even if I'm a greedy person and I want to rule the world, I have to cross hurdles, ideological hurdles for me to be able to enslave you. This is why Islam is being so attacked. It's, it's what we call a huge stumbling block, if not a wall for the enemies to break in order for them to continue with their bulldozing of the world. It's an ideological war, I'm telling you for a fact. I'll prove it to you so many different ways. You pay attention to the news, pay attention, and listen to all the news. You ever want to trigger the enemy to come out of his camouflage garb? Talk of ideologies. You will be surprised how everybody becomes alert and looks at you. The same person was your neighbor, your friend. You bring an ideology, you've triggered 
a, a domino effect that you have never seen in your life. And I speak from experience. I have tested this over and over. I sit even in interviews, and I'll, I'll purposely trigger an ideology. I want to see the reaction. Then they won't get scared. I said, think about it. You know, we're just so reckless about everything. Why did you suddenly get so perked up when I say that? It's because deep down in the heart of everybody, there is this consciousness of morality that really drives the whole attitude of a human being. And it's either you're my way, or you're against me. Or it's either you're with us, or you're against us. You know the Bush comments, right? Either you're with us, or you're against us. Going back to that, it's the ideological warfare. And ideology is built on the promotion of good and demotion of evil. But these two factors are meaningless unless there's a component that comes into position. And that's what took me runa bilda. Without Allah, you have no identity, guaranteed. Your identity is short-lived, it's cyclical, circular, okay? It's in fact ridiculous. Because you're not, an ideology has to have an eternity goal. If it lacks an eternal goal, it's a cyclical goal, because it's gonna loop. Unless it goes into an infinite mode, it's gonna loop. And a looping system means you're going in circles. See, I give you an example. Teenagers, 20 years old especially, I see many of you, I'm watching you here in this camp. It's interesting how you walk, how you dress, I watch everything you do. I see some of you walk around with your muscles, you know, exposing it. You love to show it off. I'm saying, okay, I wonder why you're showing it off. It's good. Having a good body is, is essential. It's, it's, a, it's, you know, it's our hak. You know, when somebody's healthy, they go to the gym, that says a lot about a person. That person now is concerned about his own health, and I, I admire that. But what is the reason behind it? You find the goal really is to walk around and get something temporary. It's a very tricky scenario. What happens is the goal then becomes circular. I want to look good so that I can be attractive, so that I can capture somebody. And then once I capture, it becomes boring. You think you're gonna capture that princess, <laughs> only to be dissatisfied because you thought it was the look that was gonna catch it. But there's more to life than just looks. It's the heart. So have the looks. It's beautiful. Smell good. Have a good haircut. Be fashionable. It's beautiful. No one say don't do that. In fact, in my opinion, I'm a, I'm a promoter of that. But is that what's the goal? If it is, it starts to loop. And you go into circles. And you'll be doing the same old thing. It's like the clubs. People enter the club the first time, the club opens up, everybody's gung-ho, yes! You know, we're gonna find that perfect person in this club. We're gonna fantasize. And then they find somebody, they have their good time, then it gets boring. So then they come back to the club looking for some more excitement. Only to be found that this is like a person who's always there and is part of the wall, you know, fixture. Always hanging out there, it's drinking, we're talking to the bartender, yeah, who's next coming in? Why? Because the circle is going on. You're waiting for the next bite. It just doesn't come. And, and the more you loop, the more permutations, the worse it gets. It's like a drug addict. The more you get into it, the more dosage you need. Because your satisfaction level just drops dramatically. It's like a spiral. Well, what happens? The goal of Allah is not there. So you start looping. And the minute you loop, you're done. You build your house, you build your fancy car, your neighbors will have a better house, you'll start the loop again. I need a bigger house. You retire, you'll move on to the next house. And you move on to the next thing, and the next business, or business venture, you made a million dollars, you start the next one for a billion dollars, and then a billion and a billion dollars. Okay, so you built this empire, what for? Well, it's just fun. I mean, when I look at people like, for example, uh, you look at all the billionaires out there, right? Warren Buffett, he's a simple guy. But I look at him, I say, what did you accomplish? Seriously, you're an old man now, you're a billionaire, multi-billionaire. What did you accomplish? Did you really give charity? I mean, you own majority of the stocks in McDonald's, okay, and Coca-Cola. Two things that kills most people. <clears throat> you actually have a greater accountability in your externalities, which is what John Perkins speaks about. That the investment ratio of me owning a stock that has not accounted for the externalities. And I've made a billion dollars, but I, could, I caused a $2 billion hole in the healthcare system. 
But to me, I look like a very successful billionaire. But actually, I caused a $2 billion deficit, which no one's accounted for, because it's an external factor. It's the net result of eating that kind of stuff, which, by the way, is designed to feed the poor. Because most poor people can't afford regular meals. It's the cheapest thing to eat, which then causes health problems. And the person now who's got the biggest health problem doesn't have the, account, the amount of um, insurance so it comes back to the town, to the county, the state, the government, which then feed, kills it. And it becomes a just voracious beast. So have you accomplished anything? You and I have to ask that question. When we do what we do in our societies, and although we are temporal in many of our pursuits, are we really doing things for Allah? Do we really have a permanent goal? Trust me. When you and I go to the gym, or we buy a nice dress, or we build a nice house, or we buy a fancy car, is there something in the back of my mind, oh Allah, I'm buying this for you? You know, I think about, why did Allah allow Suleiman to be so rich? He was so rich and so powerful, he was indomitable, no one could come near him. He was so rich and powerful. Oh Allah, why did you give him this wealth? What was the point? Allah says, look at how Suleiman used every tool to bring the queen to Islam. Because you can't be an average person to bring the queen to Islam. You need to be a king to bring a queen to Islam. Notice the usage. At the highest level of enormous wealth, it's all about Allah. That's why Allah says, minuna billah. Because when you believe in Allah truly, your understanding of what's wrong and what's right comes into vision. <coughs> and now it becomes an eternal goal. Now, even if you get killed, Allah takes everything away from you, you have no problem, because your identity is complete. So identity is not about organizations. I've seen many organizations form, and they have a life of their own. X, Y, Z organization. You must support it. It's an organization. Extremely important. You must feed it. This organization must live. Is it really? Why? It's very important. It identifies Islam. Oh, I see. So Islam is dependent on the organization. I get it. So if this organization did not exist, Islam would be extinct, right? We are so myopic and foolish in thinking this way. But suddenly we start feeding organizations. That's why you notice most organizations fail. They have no longevity. They die sp without spirit. And people get ap apathy. They become very, very disenchanted and they walk away. Why? Because the organization, it doesn't feed you. The biggest mistake of Muslim organizations, even Christian, Jews, but among Muslims, the biggest mistake we made is as soon as we form an organization, it becomes our identity. And we hide under the garb of the organization. Why? Because the success of the organization is my success. Why? Because I started it. I support it. I'm part of it. I'm a director. I'm a president. See? I'm the founder. Oh, so what do you need it for? He says, well, I need it. Because if it fails, it's one cut against me. Notice, we lost complete focus of Allah. Allah is no longer, Allah is just a means, like an attractor. You know, like some, some, some light you have to turn on, so everybody gets mesmerized by it. They get attracted, they come towards you, then you shut the light off. It's like a switch and, you know, what we call bait and switch. You create, you put something really nice, everybody looks at it, then you sell them something else. It's a bait and switch, you know. You bait and then you switch. That's what we're doing. Our identity is so convoluted, and I watch this over and over and over, even in Islamic centers, big, gigantic Islamic centers. All they're worried about, organization. Give us donation. We need the money. Organization, very important. And I'm thinking, what happened to Allah? Well, of course, Allah, this is Islam. You know, we have salah, we have du'as, we have lectures. Is it really? Between organizations and you take that organization mentality, it's the same problem as you and I. It's, organization actually is, a, is what we call an extension of who I am. My ego, I'm me. I have an ego. I need to give it out. I need to check it to let you know I'm a great person. And I'm going to do many things to impress you. My reflection of my ego on a grand scale is organizations and political groups. That's all it is. It's just an expression of a, of a set of people's egos amplified on a larger scale. That's all it is. And we hide under the garb. 
of anything that works. The Catholic Church will hide it under the God factor. The popes will go kill people. You got the Muslim groups hiding under the same. You got the Jews doing the same. The Jews occupy land because it's a promised land. Look, it's a promised land. So you go kill people. Displace a million people. It's a promised land. Look at the mentality, the stupidity. In the name of God, we'll butcher you, kill you, bulldoze your house, we'll kill everybody. Because God's promised me. Look at the absurdity of the entire moral system that we are violating every core moral of God, but we're leaving the name God there to legitimize it. What's different between that and you and I as people of identity? What's the difference? Seriously, no difference. We're simply thinking, I'm a Muslim, I'm a Muslima, my identity is Islam, and then I'm the antithesis of the very moral objectives of Islam. That's why we fail. Allah says, when you promote good and forbid evil, it's on my, my terms. I see within our Muslim community, we're talking about identities, how many of us actually understand Tawheed? You know, in school everybody teaches you Tawheed. Islamic school, Tawheed, Tawheed. How many of us really understand Tawheed? You will be surprised what kind of misconceptions we have as Muslims about Allah. It's amazing. <coughs> I often, and I'm not claiming to be that expert in that, but often I would talk to people, you know, we all have these little misconceptions about Allah. And those little misconceptions of defining Tawheed the right way creeps into my moral system. And my judgment and my moral system is entirely built on that thought of who is Allah. Do you know how many Muslims in the world don't fully understand Allah? That when you start discussing questions of Tawheed, they give you answers that are in gross violation of Allah. Hence, our judgment about Islam is completely on a different scale. So my advice to us all, first and foremost, pondering, you know, you're having these classes, these sessions here, where you have liquor classes and so on. These are important. But ponder, what is my true understanding of Allah? Because when it comes into focus, you won't be fooled easily. And your goals, our goals, will be so focused, our goals will be so focused going forward that we will not bargain for any price for the love of Allah. Quran mentions, Rijalun la tulhihim tijaratun wa la bayi'un an dhikrillah. Men who don't bargain for any price the of Allah. Why? <laughs> Why is Allah mentioning these people? Who are these people? Allah says, take them as a role model. Look at Sulaiman. Sulaiman was not distracted. All these little silly stories we hear about Sulaiman, you know, falling in love with a horse. This is all nonsense, it's all rubbish. You don't be fooled by these little stories that we hear. But Prophet Yusuf making a mistake, you know, uh, you know, asking, um, you know, his prisoner uh, friend, you know, he forgot Allah, right? Or the Holy Prophet frowned and turned. Don't believe these are all nonsense. This is rubbish. The ethos of these prophets was so pure that there was nothing in the universe that would distract them from Allah. It wasn't about distraction. It was about judgment at the moment in their own ethos of thinking this is the best thing to do. And whatever they do, Allah never reprimands them for it. Never. Trust me. It's in the Quran that Allah SWT mentions even when Musa goes with Khidr. Notice the story of Musa and Khidr. <coughs> Allah says to Musa, go and meet a man by the banks of this uh, sea. He will take you someplace. He will teach you something. So Musa meets him, he knows this is the man I'm supposed to meet. The man says to him, you can join me, but you won't be able to bear it. You won't be able to bear it. He says, Satajidin, inshallah, inshallah, God will find me among the patient ones. Now read the story in Surah Al-Kaf, you find when Musa goes with Khidr, and Musa, I mean Khidr, sinks the boat, Musa is asking, what you do? This is terrible. He says, Lanta stati amaiya sabr. Did I tell you? Can I have patience? But notice Musa is not apologizing. Musa says, Oh, I'm sorry. Excuse me. I really apologize. He doesn't say that. Khidr just says, Didn't I tell you you can't bear it? The ethos of Musa is totally for Allah. 
he's calculating based on his understanding that sinking a boat of a, a community is wrong. I blame him. He has to complain. In fact, if Musa was silent, that would be the mistake. He says, what happened to you, Musa? Don't you have a consciousness? This man sank it. Even if there's a higher ta'wil to it, it's, you don't know it, so you are subjected to the ta'wil you know. Notice the difference now. Suddenly Musa does not. He moves on and the child is killed. Musa gets even more aggravated. He says, didn't I tell you you can't bear it? Musa says, don't hold me liable for this. Look, Musa doesn't apologize to Khidr. He says, don't hold me liable. He doesn't say, oh, I'm, I'm very sorry, I apologize. Allah says, look at the identity of Musa. He's my prophet. He is not submitting even to our teacher because his consciousness is pure and he's not letting even another man with a higher ta'wil distract him from his obligations. SubhanAllah. <coughs> to the point where the third event takes place and then he says, okay, now it's our time to part. Then he gives him the ta'wil. Now why does he give him the ta'wil then? He says, before it you didn't have the ta'wil, so your ta'wil was based on what you knew then on what you're supposed to hold yourself liable for. That's the purity we have to have, sisters and brothers, okay? Where we stand right now, all of us here, our knowledge base is at a certain level. It's not to say that I need to go to the Hawza and gain huge amounts of knowledge so that I can submit to Allah. Wrong. We are fooled into thinking that. When you go to the Hawza and when you have Salat al layl you know, in let's say in Jam Karan, you know, and Imam Mahdi is there and he's standing next to you and the angels are descending and ascending, maybe I'll have real consciousness of God. No. You don't need to go anywhere. Allah's trial upon us is the simplicity of that purity of that motion that you and I have said. I, I am here, I'm a farmer, I'm illiterate, I'm a, you know, an illiterate worker. I don't have it, but I have a desire to promote good for evil and believe in Allah. That's my identity. That's it. You don't need organizations. In fact, the greatest identity is that. That when you have it, a collection gets together. And they create the greatest identity. <coughs> Karbala is like them. Those warriors who were there, Imam was not planning. We need to form an organization, you know, a shuhada organization. We need to prepare, we need to go and do the military, you know, work every night. So that when Karbala comes, we're ready, you know, we're armed. None of the above. Situation came, they gravitated, and they became the greatest shuhada. How is that possible? Because each one already had the identity. Even those who were Christians who became Muslims on the way, they had the identity. They joined the Imam and they became sac sacrificial. Why? Because it's a very simple reality. Allah is testing us not on the complicated matters. He's testing us on the simple matters that when you dress up the way you dress and when you go out and look the way you do and the house that you're buying and you know, every salam you're saying it, who are you saying it for? If Allah is not in that picture, it's a loop. Guarantee. But if Allah is in the picture, it becomes a perpetual goal towards Allah. Perpetual. You never go loops. Because now you're growing. It's a cyclical. It's not a cyclical. It's a growth. Even if you're going through permutation, you're going towards Allah. You're flying towards Allah. Honestly. If you really want to examine that, you will see that our obligation as Muslims it's a very simple obligation, not complicated. The simple obligation is, Oh Allah, you created me. I have an obligation to serve you. How? You don't need anything. Allah says, the way you serve me is you do everything for me. Even when you find yourself a woman to marry, you marry her for me. Even when you have pleasure with your wife, you have it for me. Huh? How's that? Allah says, figure that out. The day you do, you would have gotten your identity correct. That's the problem. Many a times, that's not why we do things. Many a times we do projects not for Allah. Or we start with Allah. If we have this calling, we start. But then it distracts us. The power comes down. The money starts flowing. And you start getting praised. The limelight starts. Everyone's calling you. You're famous. Yeah. start and suddenly the distraction takes. Before you know it, a few years down the line, you're a different creature. You started this one. You became a monster. You know how many people like that I've seen in my life? 
people are homo, this is the please, hey. And then they become directors. And they're pontificating on their seats, looking down at everybody, you, that, over there. So weren't you that little poor guy five years ago? Yeah, but I'm different now. <laughs> I'm the boss. There you go, Khalas, you're done. Allah says, you see? It looks easy when you're poor. If your vision is not clear, Allah will test you with wealth, power, loss of it, gain of it. You get the most beautiful spouse. For a girl, you get the most handsome man. For the boy, you get the most beautiful uh, wife. You get the most beautiful child. Allah says, okay, it's a trial. What are you going to do with this? Are you enamored by this? This amana that I gave you? What are you going to do with it? Are you going to now bask in your glory that you've got it? Go ahead and try it. Try it. So many people fall for that trap. Where we become so proud and arrogant that I have it. Allah says, you lost it. It's finished. That's the identity.